Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of How to Read Literature Like a Professor A Lively and Entertaining Guide to Reading Between the Lines By Thomas C. Foster They claim that no new stories have emerged. There is no such thing as a new idea, Mark Twain famously stated. It's a non-starter. All we're doing is creating a mental kaleidoscope out of old ideas. It's amazing what they come up with when we let them loose. Colored glass has been used for millennia, and we keep making new combinations, but they are the same old pieces of colored glass. Reading Literature, a guide for beginners analyzes literature as a whole, much like a professor. This enables us to expand our reading abilities and to put aside any superficial or shallow evaluations. Critical reading and study not only improves our overall abilities and understanding, but also enlivens a text and makes it more exciting. We've been taught that, despite the fact that new stories can never be created, all stories develop from previous ones. Rather than thinking of books as isolated stories, we should think of them as part of a collection. To become an expert reader, we must master the skills of context and history, memory, symbols, and patterns. Retired Professor Thomas Foster is passionate about passing on his knowledge and experience in literature and writing. According to what we've seen, there are no new stories. Is it really that difficult to understand what you're reading? There is reading, and then there is reading. Both of these options are possible, but it's up to each of us to decide which path to take when it comes to reading and learning. This brief summary will get you started on the path to sharpening your analytical skills. Learn that books should be viewed as part of a collection rather than individual stories. We'll see how each story builds on the previous one, and that literature is a complex and fascinating world. It is also important to note that while we can enjoy reading books by simply skimming the surface, the more we engage with the material and analyze it, the more vibrant it becomes. You can use this book to improve your engagement with writing and literature whether you enjoy reading or find it intimidating. The Past and the Present As a whole, literature is more than just a single story, it is a product of a long and rich history of stories. As a result, literature must be viewed in its historical and cultural context. Words and actions have no meaning at all without context, argues Gregory Bateson succinctly. Often, writers make the mistake of concentrating solely on the most important aspects of the story, such as the plot, the characters, and perhaps even some of the descriptions. We tend to concentrate on the main plot and characters when we watch a movie, as an analogy. Cinematography, sound, and editing all play a significant role in a film's storytelling if we pay attention to these elements. Background knowledge is necessary for critical reading. We need to look at the historical context before we can get into memory, symbol, and pattern. Learning to read is a lifelong process. The ability to delve deeper into memory, symbol, and pattern distinguishes advanced readers from those who aren't. Symbol, pattern, and memories. Your earliest recollection is of the first book you read. Our first books, learning to read, and the first time we felt a connection to a story are all things we remember vividly. It's possible that you've always enjoyed reading, or that you've always feared doing so. It doesn't matter where you fall on the autism spectrum, books and stories bind us to the past. Reading or hearing a story stirs up memories. Where have I read this before? Or what reminds me of this story? We ask ourselves. The more we read, as with everything else, the more we learn. As a result, we can easily switch between the books we're currently reading and those we've previously read. When we read something new, our brains should be able to sift through all of our previous readings and connect the dots. To a greater extent, we'll be able to see parallels and differences between characters, plot, and decision-making the more we read and remember. The ability to recognize and make sense of recurring symbols and patterns is a function of our memory. So when you critically analyze a piece of writing, you're looking for comparisons to other works. There are a number of symbols we must keep in the back of our minds while reading. Over time, we build up a collection of symbols that we can refer to. Because it necessitates extensive practice, developing one's symbolic imagination takes time. As a result, the more we read and engage with these topics, the more we learn. We can discover a whole new world of reading once we've mastered them. History and context play a crucial role in understanding symbols because they allow us to avoid being too simplistic. A symbol's meaning should not be reduced to a single interpretation. Symbols can mean a variety of things in the context of a story, and they don't have a single universal meaning. Metaphors, similes, and other literary devices that transform the literal into the metaphorical are important to keep in mind when analyzing a text's symbols. 
Developing a library of books from which to draw symbols helps us build our history and context through our ability to recall memories. Having a deeper understanding of symbols makes it easier to decipher their meanings. Skull and crossbones, for instance, could denote poison or pirates, to name a few possible associations. Even though red roses are commonly associated with love, they also symbolize blood. Paying attention to the text and questioning repetition, objects, and emotions that are honed in on is one way to learn how to develop our understanding of symbols. We can begin looking for patterns once we've drew from our memories and identified potential symbols. Paying attention and questioning what we're reading is the first step in learning how to recognize patterns. Archetypes are the source of patterns. For example, ideas, characters, and even plot structure are all examples of archetypes. For the same reason that patterns allow us to form relationships, we often identify with characters because they've appeared in our past. Some examples of these characters include the knight in shining armor, the lady in distress, and the bad guy. This can either help us empathize with them or make us dislike them. Both are possible outcomes from this experience. In spite of the fact that it is possible to recognize patterns and possibly predict where a story will go, the way an author crafts a narrative and how they develop a genre gives a text its own unique complexity. The monomyths many faces. One thing all of these characters, from Jane Eyre to Hamlet to Bilbo Baggins to Katniss Everdeen, have in common? While the monomyth is one of the most common plot structures in fiction, it is not without precedent. Archetypal stories have a well-known structure, but each one is unique in its execution. The monomyth is incredibly formulaic, as are many other stories. An ordinary and quiet protagonist is called upon to do something extraordinary, but they are often reluctant to do so because they feel unprepared. A mentor or mentors who coach and encourage them are next, followed by a series of tests and finally, a critical point where introspection is required. Because they are well prepared, there is a clash or conflict that has been brewing for some time. It's finally time for them to return to their normal lives having undergone an enormous transformation in the course of their heroic deed. Despite the fact that both Harry Potter and Jane Eyre follow the same basic plot structure, the two books are very different reading experiences. Since stories are so similar, this is why we never stop reading. To borrow or give an ironic nod to the source material. Intertextuality occurs when two or more texts are referenced in one another. For example, Homer's Odyssey is mentioned in James Joyce's Ulysses. In the movies, this is a common occurrence. What did you know about 10 Things I Hate About You, West Side Story, and The Taming of the Shrew being based on Shakespeare? In order to identify intertextuality, we need to know about other texts, and authors reward us for this knowledge. Fans and readers are treated to a ninjoke-like reward for reading the author's entire body of work. There are many Easter eggs in Stephen King's books, and he is known for them. In his books, he frequently makes references to minor characters, plot points, or locations from previous works. In addition, he frequently cites music lyrics, movies, books, and television shows in his writing. First-time Stephen King readers may not notice these nods because they are so subtle, but a seasoned reader knows to look for them and expect them. Our stories on a map. For a story, a location symbolism is enormous. We have a strong emotional response to space and place, and we place a high value on it. When you're in a bustling city, how does your emotional landscape differ from when you're in nature? In your mind. What images come to mind when you think of a desert? In addition to evoking emotions, space and location also have a symbolic meaning. In the Lord of the Rings trilogy, each location Frodo visits represents the character's emotions, the path to danger, and the history of the fictional world Tolkien created. Another reminder of what's at stake in the quest is the Shire's juxtaposition with Mordor. No two places are the same, which is why we must become adept at delving into a writer's use of language, whether patterns, and symbolism to decipher their intentions. Never underestimate the importance of the surrounding environment or setting in a story. Something is rotten in Denmark, Shakespeare famously declared, and this sets the tone and mood for the whole play. Furthermore, the phrase in Fair Verona, where we lay our scene, establishes the central theme that a place that values fairness and justice is about to be tested. Irony makes you stand out. The ability to recognize and appreciate irony in writing and literature is a telling sign of one's literary intelligence. If you're familiar with 90s music, you're probably aware of a popular, but rather poor, explanation of irony. This is sure to irritate even the most seasoned teacher. To be clear, if you're looking for a definitive definition of irony, you shouldn't look to Alanis Morissette's controversial song Ironic. She wrote a song about irony that contained almost no irony, which is itself ironic, one could argue. But you'll have to make that decision for yourself.
In other words, what does irony mean? Irony is the word I forget its meaning immediately after I look it up, but I kind of feel like I live in a constant state of it, Maureen Johnson said in a recent interview. We need to be on the lookout for irony, and you'll know when you come across it because your expectations will be a little bit off. To put it simply, it's a way for authors to set you up for disappointment before delivering an entirely different experience. In some cases, the reader has a better understanding of the story than the protagonist, and this is known as sarcasm. Then there's the kind of irony where the plot turns out to be the exact opposite of what the author had in mind all along. In Oedipus and King Lear, the irony is that the king only sees the truth after he has gouged out his own eyes. Until he loses his sight, he is blissfully unaware of the truth. Waiting for Gato is a great example of how to subvert a monomyth through irony. Many hints are dropped on us as readers that a journey is about to begin. But the characters don't actually go on their journey based on these cues, which come from our memories, symbols, and patterns we recognize. Nothing happens is a well-known catchphrase for the film. Nothing happens, twice, in fact. Finally, I'd like to say. Starting with the desire to learn is the first step toward reading literature with the authority of a professor. Whatever you read, don't take it at face value and always ask questions about what you're reading. That you can never know everything and that reading is like looking at art is what this book is about. We can use analytical methods to try to figure out the author's intentions, but there's no way to know for sure. As children, we were exposed to religious texts, fairy tales, folklore, myths, and even stories told around the dinner table, so we already have a lot of the tools we need to read effectively. Every story we hear or read adds to our body of knowledge, and no matter how many books we read, we can always learn something new. This is a must-read for anyone who wants to develop their critical thinking, encourage deep thinking, pursue knowledge, and find a passion for literature and writing. A storyteller's job is not to tell you how to think, but to provide you with questions that you can ponder. Reading and thinking more may be essential, after all. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.